At this conference we saw so many use cases in everyday sectors that could possibly change our life as citizens but also as consumers. Why did the OECD want to have this forum on blockchain then? Well, this goes to the heart of what we do, which is better policies for better lives. And we believe that blockchain, distributed ledger, can actually help bring better policies, advising governments for better lives. That's the heart of what we do, is advising governments on better policies for better lives. And we think blockchain can be the solution, the technology can help governments find better solutions for better lives. And at this conference we had the business side with young entrepreneurs in blockchain technology, but also the institutions uh, with politicians. How does that mix? How did you feel about that? Well, that's what we wanted to do because they're all stakeholders, okay? And you can't develop solutions uh, in a vacuum. So it's important that government works with business, but also works with civil society to find the best solution. So, you know, what we are very good at doing at the OECD is providing a forum where people come together to discuss solutions and then hopefully implement solutions. But equally what we do is actually we do a lot of capacity building where people individually need help and we provide standards. So that it's sort of the heart of what we do. So this is really one a good example. And the, the vibe is amazing here. I mean, we had uh, nearly 20,000 people connecting online to watch uh, our session. So I think we've actually identified a very, uh, there's a very significant interest in blockchain and, and I think obviously we're going to see a lot come out of this conference. Big interest but also a big need uh, both from the public but also from all entrepreneurs here. What they want is have legal and regulatory certainties and they still don't really know where it is all heading. What is the position of OECD? So I think there, I think one of the things I think we certainly do need is to think about perhaps some sort of overarching framework to sort of help guide governments in terms of how to deal with blockchain. That's something that many have talked to me about and something that I guess we will think about and talking to our committees. But I think certainty is, is clear. Sorry, investors need certainty, business needs certainty, okay? And that is certainly something I think part of this is educating regulators on what the possibilities are um, for blockchain and what perhaps the approaches are and that is sort of what we do in terms of bringing people together and that in turn helps they hear business and they hear businesses frustrations and that, that is good but equally they're here to learn okay they're here to learn uh, which is a good thing so what we want is uh, ultimately to have a center for po blockchain policy advice to government that can actually work with business and government to really try and leverage the benefits of this technology but equally mitigate the disadvantages of this technology. And these regulations have to go country to country or is there a way to have some kind of globalised regulations? I, I think that, uh, th as I said, I think having an overarching framework where there are common principles because often we find that you know, there are common things which we are all concerned about. So for example, in distributed ledger, one issue is scalability and how do you, what's the, how do you solve that problem? The other one for governments or, or for industry is interoperability, right? So there are many issues like that. Or how do you deal with issues like confidentiality and privacy of information? So, you know, we're about actually helping governments find solutions to issues actually and working with business. So I do think um, you, you, we're not all the same and we all have different sort of regulatory regimes. But what you've got to do is draw from that common principles because you may all be different but often you find you find you face the same issues and you're often solving the problems of the same principles. So I think principles are very important and that's where I think we can help. And education is also really important. In the blockchain world we see so much enthusiasm but also so much fears. Mm. Where do you stand, you personally? Oh, look, I think that the beauty of distributed ledger, its most powerful thing is it enables trust. It enables trust. And if we think about today, one of the biggest issues in the world today is a lack of trust. So I think blockchain really is critical in enabling trust. The second thing that is amazing about blockchain is in enabling trust, it also disintermediates uh, many uh, potential parties uh, in chains. 
which often can reduce the cost to consumers. And that's very attractive, whether it be for consumers of government services or consumers of products. So I think that, that's what excites me about this technology. And you know, I first gave a speech about this uh, about four years ago. And uh, when I first came, I couldn't believe, just when you start thinking how uh, potentially uh, the value it can produce for society uh, is is incredibly transformative. I think it's it basically I think as transformative as the internet itself because suddenly you actually have a technology that can actually enable basically the the distribution of value uh, in a sort of trustless society, which is you know pretty pretty amazing. So it could dramatically change some industries, for instance, the, the, the financing sector, the banking. Well, I think if you look at distributed ledger, the three major use cases are in government services, in supply chain uh, areas, supply chain finance, etc., and in financial services. They're the three big areas where we see enormous potential. Uh, so, at all of those, we see. So, for example, in government services, you think about having. Um, a title system based on distributed ledger. Okay, now for some countries that's attractive because they've had issues in the past of, you know, not a, a proof of ownership or not ownership, you know, not having ev any evidence at all. For other countries, they see it as a very efficient me mechanism of collecting taxes on property or being efficient in clearing property. Equally, in voting on distributed ledgers, it's immutable; it can be trusted. So there's another example. If you look at supply chain, okay, you think about today, in many countries they're concerned about where their food is coming from, in Providence. You know, basically what we see in many applications where basically you can follow the Providence of your good to make sure that actually the, it, it is what, it, what the producer says it is. You can see, for example, if you're, you know, um, you're buying some fish, you can see where it was actually caught, right? And it being verified by a party that it was caught there. So I think, but, you know, once you have that supply chain, there are many other possibilities because then you can look to finance the fishermen directly or whatever. And then if you look at financial services where you have many institutions who their job has been to assure trust, okay, then suddenly you can contemplate a world where you don't need those parties to assure trust. And I think in financial services, I think one of the probably the most transformative things that will happen in the next few years is I think central bank digital currencies because this area uh, is inevitable, and but it will mean changing the way central banks think. Uh, but it will mean that no longer it will be very inclusive because it means no longer do you need to have a bank account. You've actually got uh, an account, uh, a digital wallet with the central bank. So I think some of these things, when you start thinking the consequences of that, are incredibly transformative incredibly transformative but I mean this is not going to happen overnight we're talking things that may take decades to occur but I think we're now at the point of building blocks and that's what this conference is all about is actually helping people build those building blocks so we we will have this conference next year and this conference next year will have a different theme and hopefully today's pilots will be operational and we'll all learn this is this is a journey and all these transformations, I see the, the positive aspect for them as an individual, but are they only going to be for the best? Uh, there's a risk of job cuts, for instance, in some sectors. Well, look, uh, it's, well, let's say, we know that this is the issue of, you know, this is part of the whole uh, going digital project at the OECD, and, and we can't talk about uh, blockchain and not talk about artificial intelligence and the internet of things connecting the digital to the physical and even things like predictive data analytics okay so it's part of a package of things we know that digitalization jobs is an issue but it's another area that the OECD we are looking at very closely is impact on jobs we know new jobs will be created from this at the same time but there will be displacement but I think Unfortunately, this is part of the digital, re uh, digital revolution and the issues that have been raised. But it is something the OECD is taking on board and we've actually um, have done a number of studies on basically digital transformation and the imp impact on labour markets. And it is an issue we need to think about because we want, what we also want is an inclusive society, right? So we need to make sure that obviously that issue is also, we need to keep an eye on, on this issue also. So overall, you're quite enthusiastic towards this digitalization and blockchain. Well, I, yes, I am because I do think that uh, it, it, if it's done properly, it will result in better lives. 
it will result in uh, more inclusive finance because of distributed ledgers. Uh, you know, and I think it will result hopefully in better government because of better accountability. Uh, so, and hopefully it will result in better lives, particularly in areas like supply chain finance, where we have huge issues in many countries in terms of, uh, you know, workers, uh, slave labour, uh, you know, inappropriate treatment, the environment, people avoiding taxes. And you know what? Today, today, the crowd, the crowd is the, probably the most powerful aspect of society today. And if you think about it, the social licence is, is what the, the crowd demands. And I think solutions like distributed ledger are one way of actually enabling the, the crowd to be empowered to make change. So I think, actually, I think that's why I think I'm very positive about it. And out of these two days of, of talks, was there one use case that you thought, wow, this is something that could really change my life or lives? Uh, I, 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 I will say uh, that I think in the area of infrastructure, this morning, we uh, chair, session I chaired, it was very good because we had a, a, a gentleman who uh, from Arcadis uh, who spoke about saying we could do some very simple things on infrastructure that I think are very powerful. For example, what he said is three things. One, we can record the, the actual, uh, what has actually, actually happened in an infrastructure supply chain. Okay, so the parties know the time and the date that something happened. You then got an immutable record that it's happened. Okay. Secondly, he said, is actually just simply recording the date and time somebody is paid. Okay, which creates a record. And thirdly, the date and time that something has complied with a, a standard or whatever. So if you're building a bridge, you think about it, that it actually happened, that somebody got paid for it, and then in fact it was done to the right standard. Okay. And he said, these little steps can be very powerful if the, that information then can be immediately available to investors, to the community. I think that was quite powerful because sometimes the most, the most, some of the best things in the world is, are simple and this is simple. So I think that's what, I thought this was very attractive this morning, what, uh, what he suggested actually. But look, there are so many, I think one of the other things that I've seen recently is the concept of uh, blockchain based digital advertising where basically um, advertisers, people share their data and are rewarded for sharing their data but it's in a lockbox protecting their confidentiality and basically advertisers uh, reward them for using their data. So this basically is interesting because I think it attacks the sort of traditional platform based business model which actually basically the data is actually used for free, not really in a way. Uh, but I think this is very transformative actually where basically consumers actually see the benefit from actually sharing their data. They, they actually see rewards from their data. So I think that's another one that uh, we want to watch, especially in the er days of privacy. Do you own or would own cryptocurrencies? Uh, yes, I do own a little bit of uh, cryptocurrency, yes. Somebody gave it to me as a birthday present. So I shouldn't say I acquired it. I was given it as a present, actually. So, uh, and it's still sitting there. So, but, but I must say, I think that the issue on uh, blockchains, if you want a permission blockchain, which clearly is, is a, a pretty easy concept because we all know one another, it's between parties. The big challenge, I think, is permissionless blockchains. And I think if we're going to have permissionless blockchains, because you know, people who don't know one another, they have to be traceable. They have to be traceable for governments, tax authorities. This, I think the challenge here is people have to accept that, that permissionless blockchains, you can, between us we can be anonymous, but some authority needs to be, have the ability to trace. And I think if it's accepted we have trace, traceable permissionless blockchains that are available to those that need to have them, I think that is, there we have two ways of evolving. So I think both probably will evolve, but clearly the other issue with uh, permissionless blockchain is its scalability because of the proof of concept process. But it still is useful if you're perhaps with a small number of people. So I think we'll probably have an evolving of, of both really uh, tight. So I think it's really interesting, um, but we're gonna have probably a lot more discussions as a result of this, uh, of issues like this.